back. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken, also known as Will Flannery. And I am Lady Glockenflecken, also known as Kristen Flannery. And we have a wonderful episode for you today. Uh, but before we get to our guest, uh, who also happens to be a cardiologist. That's right. Uh, which is something that's been in the news lately. By the time everyone's hearing this, uh, we actually already know the outcome of um, Damar Hamlin, who is the safety on the Buffalo Bills, who a, a week ago, uh, recording this based on the date we're recording this, um, one week ago, he collapsed on the field mm -hmm. in the middle of the game and had about uh, nine minutes of CPR that was done. And we just found out today, one week later, that he is being discharged from the hospital, which is awesome. Yeah. Just... Pretty incredible. That's that's pretty quick. It's not as quick as you. Uh, so you you have that going for you. Well, yeah, thanks. It's you know it's uh, silver linings, I suppose. <laughs> um, but no, it's 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 such a you know I was watching that game, I mm -hmm. saw him collapse, and um, and it just kind of in my mind I was like, this you know he may have had just a cardiac arrest because you, mm -hmm. you know you you hear especially as a medical professionals these types of stories always get out there and and people are talking about it a lot you you hear about young athletes who have a sudden cardiac arrest and get CPR get defibrillated and mm -hmm. and um it was it was hard to it was something i'd been i've been thinking about just off and on most of the week um just cuz for those who may not know um yeah. we have a personal history with this you had a cardiac arrest I had a cardiac in your arrest. sleep in May of 2020 and I did 10 minutes of CPR on you uh mm -hmm. before paramedics arrived and shocked you and took you to the hospital and all that stuff so this was obviously kind of a triggering event yeah in our yeah. house but there was there were two things about it that I found, I found there were, were, you know, overall positives. And one is that this, it started some conversations uh, in, on, on social media, because this is such a public event. This is on national TV. Uh, they were talking about CPR on the national broadcast. And the first thing is, is people talking about the difference between heart attack and cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, as I've talked and we've both talked about what happened to me, there's, there's this misconception or just really just, a, a maybe just a lack of knowledge of the general public of understanding what a heart attack is and what a cardiac arrest is because yeah, they're I didn't very know different things. When it happened to you and yeah. they were, they were using these terms and I was like, wait, 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 you got to back up. So is this a heart attack or, yeah. you know, like it was unclear. Right. Um, I think, you know, how these things are portrayed in the popular media contributes to it. It's all just sort of used interchangeably, but it's and, actually very different. And a heart attack is when you lose blood flow to the muscle of the heart uh, that causes damage to the heart. Uh, and that can lead to lots of other things. It can lead to death. It can lead to a cardiac arrest, uh, among other things. I'm not a cardiologist, so I'm not going to speak too much about it. But And maybe uh, that is, is part of what contributes to the confusion is that often right. a cardiac arrest might follow a heart attack. Right. Um, and just from the casual observer, you don't necessarily notice the difference between but a, them. A cardiac arrest is where the heart stops pumping for... Uh, there's a lot of different reasons for it. And in, in the case of uh, DeMar Hamlin, you know, we don't totally know the cause of it, but we do know that he had a, an abnormal heart rhythm that, that required a shock from a defibrillator. And so regardless of what the cause of his cardiac arrest was, uh, for me, it was a ventricular fibrillation. Actually, we don't know the underlying cause, but I had an abnormal rhythm that was shockable. And so, and, and that's really, that's what you hope to have. You want to... Well, to, you hope to, to just not have... Well, you hope to have to not have a period. But if you have a cardiac arrest, the one of the, the, the main factors of survival is, is getting chest compressions as quickly as possible, but also having access to a defibrillator and receiving that shock. And, and sometimes you have a rhythm that's not shockable, and sometimes you do. 
And uh, um, it's my understanding that Damar Hamlin did have it, and they were able to restore a normal rhythm with CPR, with, with defibrillation. And uh, a week later, he's out of the hospital. It's yeah, just it's awesome. it's incredible. It's great. And then the other thing um, that was talked about a lot was the mental health side of things. Yeah, I was really encouraged that that was the direction of the national conversation around it, um, or at least of, of part of the conversation. Because I talk all the time about the fact that these major medical traumas that happen for patients, they don't just happen to the patient. They happen to the families, to the loved ones, to the witnesses and the bystanders and the people that do CPR. Those are all also very traumatic experiences to have um, when someone close to you has a medical trauma or when you witness a medical trauma, especially when it's something that... Um, that is a really scary looking one, um, like a cardiac arrest is, that stays with you and that does affect mental health. So I was really, really happy to hear all the discussion around um, the players and the coaches and, you know, everybody in the stadium. And um, hopefully we'll see, but hopefully that can help spark discussions about what can we do to support those people? Um, Cause it's great to, to acknowledge that and be aware of it. That's the first step, but it doesn't help much if we don't then move on and, and do something to support them. So, um, so yeah, I was, I was obviously very sad for um, Damar and his family, but I was very happy to hear that that was the direction that this all took. Cause they very easily could have just kind of swept it under the rug and gotten on with the game. And, you know, that's what we would have expected in the past. So I was really pleased yeah. that that is not what happened. Yeah. And so, and we're just so thrilled uh, that it, it looks like, um, you know, he's, he's going to be okay and still with us. And so uh, anyway, yeah, it yeah, was, it was uh, that was something. Scary. Yeah, it was. It was. And so, uh, with that, now we're we're going to be talking today with uh, Rohan Francis, uh, who is a cardiologist and a medical YouTuber. And I, I I love his content. He's he's really if you guys, so he's a MedLife Crisis is his YouTube channel, uh, and does just phenomenal videos combining a uh, a uh, a lot of a lot of education around a lot of different topics regarding to cardiology and other areas of medicine, uh, and also injecting some humor in there. And that's one of my favorite things. I love when people do that. Um, I love people show their senses of humor and, uh, make people laugh, especially in medicine as we need more of that. And so he provides uh, a lot of that on social media. And so it was, it was great to talk with him. And he's also from the UK. So it's kind of ah, fun to be able yes. to talk about the differences between the UK and the US systems. Yes. We got to get into that a little bit. So let's, without further ado, let's, uh, let's I feel like, uh, do it. Uh, <laughs> God, that's how we're going to start this. All right, here we go. Dr. Rowan Francis. <laughs> All right, we're here with Rohan Francis, one of uh, my personal favorite people that I see on YouTube from time to time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, thank you for the invite. I'm, I'm honored to be here. You know, I actually, I, I will tell you that um, I just yesterday, I watched your TEDx talk <laughs> on, okay. uh, that you just posted, I think, what, a few weeks ago. And, um, and it was it was really it was wonderful. You did a great job, and it almost made me want to exercise. <laughs> well, it, you know, if it got you close, then you can do a bit of, you know, placebo exercise, maybe. <laughs> That's right. Vicarious exercising. No, it was really good. Tell me, how was that that whole process? Uh, was, was that um was was, uh, was a lot of obviously probably a lot of work went went into it on your end, but uh, uh, how long did that did it take to get that thing going? Well, I mean, in terms of just calendar time it actually took sort of over two years because it was pre-pandemic that it was planned and so it kept getting delayed uh -huh. and delayed but um the subject matter is is something that i talk about quite often so it wasn't too challenging but getting my friend to have his heart scanned on stage and everything was a little bit of a technical challenge and i think i've never seen were... something like that on a <laughs> on a ted talk that was great yeah i wanted to try and offer something a bit new but um i think you of all people will um, uh, appreciate or understand my, my pain because I got off stage and I realized I'd forgotten two jokes and uh, <laughs> there weren't that many jokes in it, to be honest. So uh, that, that's, that's it's, it's taken the, the shine off. 
Yeah. You know what? What really is awful is whenever like I post a video or a skit, and then someone in the comments chimes in with like a joke that's just so good that I did not include. You and can always just steal like, it for a future one. I mean, that's what I, I do. <laughs> oh, of course. Like, you do that. It's just, oh, man. Like, how, Why didn't I think of that? It's like, yeah. are people able to do this better than me? This is, what is this? It's, it's never You're a good feeling. You're probably in the top 10% of funny people, right? So, uh, I, You know, it's, I always tell people, it's, um, you know, because I, I do call myself a comedian. But there's is a very clear distinction in my mind between like your your person who is like straight stand up comedy who just went through the ranks, go into open mics, you know, every night for years and years uh, to to hone their craft, and then kind of what I do. Uh, I won't speak for you, but what I do, which no, is same, yeah. is you know inject comedy into this this base of knowledge we already have in medicine, it, it kind of feels like, uh, like cheating in a way, uh, to, to call myself a comedian. Self-appointed well, comedian. Yeah. <laughs> well, is, was it self-appointed or did somebody else start describing you like that first and then it's kind of stuck? Cause that's how it's happened to me. Cause I, I've always felt really uncomfortable with the label for exactly the mm -hmm. same reasons as you say, because all the stand up nights I've done have been not, not medical, but they've been, geeky kind of sciencey themed and it's a it's a it's a really soft audience you know they're gonna laugh at your nerdy jokes um i think so his first I label was more like sixth grade troublemaker i think that's yeah, what other people have was, given him that was i was a <laughs> class clown to, to to begin with um, well so then then the origin was <laughs> the the roots were there did you did you start doing comedy before you got into medicine um no no it was the first like proper stand-up gig I ever did was at medical school. Yeah. Um, but then I haven't done too much that regularly, to be honest. It was more just kind of talks that I'd do yeah. for the job that I would then make funny. Um, so it wasn't something I pursued until quite recently. Tell me about that first, that, that what you did in, uh, in med school, that, that first time, you know, really trying to make an audience laugh on stage because I can tell you about mine and it wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in retrospect, I've still got actually got the recording. Um, oh, do you? Oh, good. I find I, tremendously difficult to watch. But uh, <laughs> all, all things considered, it, it could have gone a lot worse. It, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad, but it was just kind of funny stories from you know, being a medical student and it was to medical students. So it was, it was pretty easy. The um, audience was but, there. They were primed for it. They were ready. Yeah. 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 But, uh, oh, I had plenty of, of complete bombs as well. So <laughs> yeah, I was, thankfully uh, they weren't filmed. I was <laughs> right. So was yours, a, you have an audio recording of it because I, I still have, you have video. See, I, I don't have, I have a, of my very first stand up set somewhere. I, I think I know where they are. They'll never see the light of day. But it was um it was in two thousand probably two thousand four this guess is the year I graduated high school and it was just it was I had like cassette tapes that was I had like a cassette recorder <laughs> uh, and um, I remember listening to it maybe like ten years after the 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 fact and uh, it was it was rough to listen to it's yeah. and and it's something I I tell everybody you know uh, is. Well, it's just like a universal truth of anything in life, but yeah. in particular in comedy and in medicine is the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Right. <laughs> and so, um, whenever I have people ask me for advice, like there, cause I'll, I'll get emails of people, Hey, I, I, I'm interested in comedy or doing stand up. I'm in medicine. All in, you know, they kind of want to do some of this stuff. I always tell them like, you just got to like jump in. You just got to do it. You got to write the jokes. You Trial gotta, by and fire. You, and you got to just try it. And either it's going to be funny or it's not. And you keep the stuff that works and you throw away the stuff that doesn't. And they never see the light of day. And uh, and that's it, really the only way, to, I think, to get better at, at comedy. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd say the same advice for sort of making videos and things. That just, yeah, just I, go I, for it. I love what you... So, uh, I, I, yeah, I, was, I was so thrilled to have you on because there's not a whole lot of people out there I think that are really trying to combine these two worlds. And what I, what I feel, and what I mean by that is medicine and comedy, but you, your take on it is I'm so impressed by it because you really do a great job of the educational aspect of it. And I think that's, it's really, um, uh, a, 
I think something that you're doing that really not a lot of people do it to the extent that you are with your videos. First of all, the production value. Like I look at your videos and then I look at mine and it's it's like I'm like a caveman, like trying to make these videos like with my elbows. That's what it feels like. So well done on your production value. Do you do all this yourself? I do it all myself. Um, yeah. I, for the last uh, few videos, I've, I've started to try and enlist an editor, but I'm still doing most of the editing. I think I'm not very good at explaining, um, but I can't. I can't let that. I mean, that's a very kind compliment, but I can't let it go without reciprocating, because <laughs> maybe not the production values in terms of the camera, <laughs> but the production. That's part values of my charm. Terms... That's part of my charm. I think exactly. It's the TikTok uh, aesthetic, right? Uh, right. It's more authentic. Yeah, exactly. Um, but your cast of characters, you know, your your. You've got whole, you know, it's not just short form video anymore. You've got character arcs, you've got uh, A plots and B plots. And it's like this rich world now, which is just amazing. And how, are you, how do you feel about my cardiologist, by the way? Ooh, I've got to question. ask you. I mean, I can't, you know, like I mean, the cardiologist nephrologist <laughs> war is, is just is just glorious. Um, and I can't um, criticize. You know, I'd, I'd love the cardiologist <laughs> to be depicted as this kind of George Clooney Debonair um, heartthrob, but uh, but you know there. you got to do it if I could. We're starting with if this I... though, so that's a tall order. <laughs> you're you're more George Clooney than I am. I'll no, tell you that. No, but uh, um, but I can't I can't I can't criticize any of the cardiology characteristics. They're they're spot on. Have you have you personally ever had any any confrontations with a nephrologist? I, I get on fairly well with them. Uh, well, no, actually, um, we I did have a bit of a a, a run in. Um, which is which is odd because the nephrologist wanted to dialyze uh, someone that I thought should just be allowed to to die. Um, and intensive care had, had it was just it was it was it was a complete inverse of the normal discussion when um, uh, you know we try and we have to convince nephrologists sometimes to to mm. give patients a spin. So it was it was the opposite. But that's the only time. Otherwise, I uh, I think we're we're very collegiate. It didn't come to blows at all, though. No, no, I, I, uh, it's it's not not on that occasion. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I have, that time. I have prescribed uh, a gram of fruzamide once. Um, a gram. A gram, and uh, okay, even even as an ophthalmologist, I know that's a <laughs> that's a fair amount. With the nephrologist blessing. So, so that was really? like my, that was like, wow, see, we can, we can come together on, on something. That, uh, that, related that, to that should be, I hope you wrote that case up because that's, that's reportable. <laughs> that that's... was the whole case. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Nephrologist said I could, I did the end. <laughs> um, well, I also want to talk about just social media in general. Uh, so you, I guess you started on YouTube, right? This was kind of where as far as making uh, Twitter, content, probably. Um, okay. Uh, I, I I came to all of them quite late. I was was not on Facebook or any of these things. And then in the UK, we had uh, it's it's repeating itself now with with our junior doctors at the moment. A lot of political issues, and so back in 2015, 16, there was talk of uh, doctors going on strike, and so I had to try and find out what was going on. I went to the kind of usual discussion forum and it, and it seemed to be dead. And I sort of asked my friends, where's, where's, where's the new, where do I get the news? And it was all on Twitter and Facebook. So I joined with a very specific reason in mind, but then quickly saw that it could be, be this really useful educational tool. And mm -hmm. then I discovered memes and I was like, right, there's no stopping now. It's uh... <laughs> and then I quickly got very bored of the politics, to be honest. Yeah. So you just focused on the, a lot of the educational aspect of things. I've actually, I've learned some cardiology from you. So I certainly wow. uh, appreciate the, uh, I've learned um, zero taking the time. Uh, ophthalmology from you. <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. You know, you know, you don't, don't, don't sleep in the context. I know that. Much. Yep, there you, go. Uh, you know what, if that's, if that's the only thing you can take away from, uh, the, the years I've spent, uh, <laughs> on my craft in ophthalmology, that's fine. Uh, totally that and not, not using Visine. I hope you've gotten that too. Um, yes, and, uh, <laughs> uh, how about how long does it take you to put together? Cause, cause your videos, they're a lot, they're quite a bit longer. I don't say I can't even imagine like making like a, you know, 10, 15, sometimes 20 minute video. Um, and so 
I've got two questions for you. How long would you say start to finish does it take you in the writing process, the editing, everything? Uh, and then also, how do you find your topics? Because that's a question finding, I get asked a lot. Yeah. Um, finding topics, I, I don't find uh, a challenge. I've got a list, which is over 200 of ideas. So any, you know, I, I, anything I read or just stuff at sure. work or whatever, I'll just jot down an idea. So I've got no shortage of, of things to cover, but writing is the part of the process that I enjoy most. And I, I really like just, I think that's the privilege of, of kind of being a bit of a generalist um, and why YouTube's quite, um, quite fun is, is I can just each month, you know, find a new thing to get really into and, and then sort mm -hmm. of research and, and write. So writing I'll do over the course of maybe a week or two. And then uh, shooting is the bit I hate. And, and it's, it's most, I, I can't stand it. Uh, I hate every part of it. And, um, <laughs> uh, and it's mostly just, you know, finding a uninterrupted hour or something. Right. Um, and then the editing I'll, I'll just do in evenings over maybe another two weeks. So in, I, I, ideal world, I get one out once a month, but in reality, it's a bit less frequent than that. Do you feel a, one thing that I, I, that really bothers me about, about being so active and creating all this content is that I hate the feeling of, of having to put something out like that. You get that, or at least for me, you know, I like get the, homework. that, that, that uh, kind of that gnawing feeling like, oh, it's been a little while since I posted something. Everybody's waiting on me to put content out. It's like you you have that that bug in your brain that's just kind of like, and, and and it's that's not a fun way to I think to have to go about social media. But I, I think it's it's just part of being a content creator is that you have that uh, that feeling like you need to put something out for your audience. And, and, uh, I don't know if you've ever felt that or that, that kind of, a. I I I don't think feeling. I have actually, I, I've kind of said to myself that I'm doing this as a hobby and I, I want to enjoy it. So if I ever get to that point where I'm feeling sort of pressure, then I'm, I'm not necessarily enjoying it. And I think in my case, I, my videos can come out pretty infrequently. So there's people forget yeah. about me. Often the top comments <laughs> are like, Oh, you're alive. And, uh, you know, so, <laughs> so, um, I'm not, not too worried about that, but, uh, good. That's I, a healthy, healthy way to go about it. Yeah. I'm the neurotic one. Okay, good. That we've established that. Go ahead. I mean, do you think you're, is it the pressure of wanting to put, or, or, or is it also that you're craving that little hit of, uh, Ooh, you know, good question. you know, putting something out, yeah. getting all the, the comments and mm -hmm. the likes. Uh, it's, cause it is quite addictive, a, right? I mean, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a, I think it's a, it's a combination of the two. Like one of, one of them is there's certainly a, certainly a part of it, especially with doing shorts and things that are like one to two minutes, sometimes three minutes long that, um, that if you don't keep doing it, the audience is going to forget about you because social media moves so quickly and mm -hmm. your con my content is so short that it's it's things kind of just come and go much more rapidly than it would be if I was doing more long form content. And so I, I certainly feel that um, that it's it's kind of a I think it's just like an arrogant way of thinking on my behalf, like, oh, all you know, I have how many like eight hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube. All of them are waiting for me as if yeah, they have nothing really. better to do with their lives. <laughs> I'm glad you said it, not me, because I was thinking it. <laughs> and uh, and so sometimes I do have to remind myself, like, okay, these people, they're they're just like looking at your videos, like when they're on the toilet, <laughs> you know, like let's not give yourself too much credit here. Like the, this isn't Nobel Prize worthy work. Like it's okay if they wait a few days to see a video. So there's that part of it, and I really don't like that. And that's that's been something that's come up as the plat my platform has grown is like, I, I've started feeling that more. Um, and I then think that's a self-induced pressure. I, oh yeah. It's, it's a totally like, you know, my super tentorial kind of issues, but um, it's uh, but to your point, there is the dopamine hit. Right. Mm. And I don't know about you, like for me, because of the, because of the shorts and I'm posting them on TikTok and YouTube, getting that immediate feedback 
the immediate likes and comments and people telling you you're funny and I love this and oh Jonathan whatever like that is like you get into it, it is a bit of addicting and um you know there's obviously there's actually studies that have looked at that and the different platforms mm. and TikTok is the worst offender by the way that's uh by far the most addictive platform yeah. so you're you're yeah, smart yeah. to stay away from it by the way I don't know if you post on TikTok or not but I I've, I think I've made like 12 TikToks in like four years or something, but yeah. I find it, it kind of, I don't, I, don't, I don't enjoy the experience of being on TikTok. So I don't know. I just find it too frenetic and mm -hmm. um, just a, kind of a bit stressful. But but this, this yeah, I think short form, I think you're absolutely right. There is a big difference between, um, and th th I think we're all prone to this kind of spotlight effect that you think everybody's waiting for you or watching what you're doing. Nobody cares. Nobody's, you know, nobody's <laughs> thinking right. about you. Um, Don't worry. He it, has me to keep him in check. Oh yeah. I can see that. Absolutely. No. <laughs> um, I'm curious too, if this had the difference between you has something to do with your specialties, because I would imagine as a cardiologist, you are much more important and busy than an <laughs> ophthalmologist. I thought you were, I thought you were going in a very a different direction there. I thought you were going to say, "Oh, you know, you're you're less patient or something like that." But no, you went you went no, straight for the jugular. Just, you have real okay. work to be doing. So that's that's some of those she does it. Yeah, it's straight for the straight for the throat there. Uh, yeah, it's a good it's a good point. You I'm know, not wrong. although I, I would I tend to disagree. I mean, who's to say what's more important, the eyeballs or the or the heart? I don't, I don't know. It's uh, it's it's up for debate. That's all I'm saying. It's uh, they're both I, are. Perhaps this I, is why yours stopped. Uh, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, I did a video where I ranked all the organs, and oh boy. Uh, I, I did a tier list of organs. Obviously, there's no surprise where the heart went. I mean, yes. I'm I was just in right neutral. Right below the brain, right? Adjudic. No, no. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, let's not let's Ooh, not go there. Li liver, I had, subject. I, I had the liver equal with the with the heart. They're they're the two best. Oh, but I, eyes were a tier, so not okay. The very top, I, but I uh, appreciate -tier. that. Yeah, I, I is the, amazing. The liver got up there, huh? Uh, I liver mean, is amazing. Liver is incredible I mean, and, it's, and it's, very it's, under, it's underrated. It's fine. I, I, Underrated, that's, yeah. That's, whoa, where whoa. was the spleen? It's, it's got two circulations. I mean, it's spleen, it's got spleen. I think was D D tier. <laughs> okay, good. Um, that's... You agree on that? I would, I would absolutely agree with that. I absolutely. think if you can leave live a pretty normal life without an organ, then it, it can't it's, really be it's that low. important. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you knock um, the kidneys down a little bit just because there's two of them, and you could live that, without that's, one? That's that, that, uh, that's why the lungs got. Relegated, uh, but uh, the kidneys. I, I do rate the kidneys very highly. Yeah, I, I, I um, I've got a soft spot for kidneys, but um, oh, don't tell the nephrologists you work with. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we're, we're all friends. We're all friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, whenever you you do a lot of speaking, I've noticed. Right, you're kind of going around and and oh, only only recently, I, I decided, oh, really? like at the end of last year, I thought I'd start saying yes to these different invites and things mm -hmm. um so i did a few sort of science festivals and the tedx thing and some corporate gigs which i've never done before which were kind of um what do you thought what do you think about those yeah i mean they they pay they pay pretty well that's they, pay, the they pay pretty well yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's the first i was like oh okay i didn't realize people would get that kind of stuff um but uh they were a bit weird because they're not um it was like a, a financial company that, that mm -hmm. they were kind of trying to do a talks at Google style thing. They're a big like investment firm and um, very science and maths driven. So I knew the audience right. would be super geeky. So I tried to make the talk kind of um, a bit tailored for them and maybe a little bit challenging. And I, it, it was fine. It went okay, yeah. but it was a weird vibe. And, and, and I thought, I'm not, I don't know if I want to do much of this. It it feels a bit weird. I feel this. I feel a very similar way when I when I go outside of the medical community. Uh, you know, it's it's like it's like our home base, right? When we're speaking, it's like we we know how these people think. We know what they're all about. They also know what we're about. And so much of I found with public speaking is 
understanding where the audience is and, and what their expectations are for you. So like, I'll give you an example. The first couple of, when I was first, the Glockenflecken thing was kind of taken off. And um, or actually, it was, it was actually before it took off. The first few speaking events I did where I was speaking as Dr. Glockenflecken, you know, not a whole lot of people were really familiar with my work. And I was thrown in the, in the middle of a plenary session and asked to tell jokes. And uh, it didn't go real well because people at conferences, medical conferences, they're, they're really not there. They're not expecting some weird looking guy who's all arms and legs to <laughs> oh, they never heard of <laughs> to go up there and, and just tell jokes uh, for yeah. 10 minutes in between talks about, you know, iridocyclitis and, you know, uh, it just <laughs> that cataracts. Is. You know, so it's, it's just a very strange thing. And so what I learned is to that really when you're speaking at like medical conferences and medical groups like that, it's combining the education and the comedy. That's like the key because medical audience, they, they want to learn. They're, they like, they love learning things. So if you can kind of disguise the comedy as something that's educational, you're going to get a lot further with those audiences. And speaking of learning things, I noticed something very interesting to me, I thought, and I think a lot of medical professionals will be able to relate to this on your Twitter feed, I think it was, <clears throat> where you shared a note from your school that you had found. Yeah, Do you yeah. want to tell our listeners about that? Oh, that was great. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've discovered this school report from when I was seven years old um, a little while ago, and uh, uh, it, it was it was kind of just language you would never associate with a school report today because it was just laying into me, just saying that I'm <laughs> I'm basically likable. That's how it started. Basically likable. Yeah, um, that's, what, that's, rough. What, that's what my wife calls me. Um, and uh, but but I, you know, I'm disruptive. I um, never, you know, focus. I'm I'm naughty. I'm and uh, all these kinds of things. And of course, you know, I think now with kind of neurodivergence being much more understood and, you know, you can recognize that was sort of a typical kind of ADHD as a kid. Um, but it, it's just, uh, you know, it made me laugh a lot how, how they, they absolutely, uh, tore me, tore me to pieces, but, uh, that was quite funny. <laughs> well, I, until very recently, I worked in gifted education for almost a decade. And so I saw that at note and I immediately knew what was going on. And then it was followed by, um, a psychological assessment that your mother took mm. you to. And you said you were, you were about seven yeah, around this yeah, time, yeah. seven or eight. And then the assessment was saying that you were testing at the levels of, you know, a 14, 15 year old. And so, you know, my thought was, well, he's probably very bored yeah, in that course. classroom learning about the ABCs or whatever. So I think a lot of medical professionals kind of not all of them, of course, but but I I bet it's a overrepresented population of you that maybe can relate to that story as children of just kind of wanting to to get on with it and having to go so slow in the classroom. And then, and then we have, uh, we, you know, are, are kind of goof off in class yeah. and then we all become, into the class we all become medical comedians. <laughs> See, that's, that's just, exactly. that's that's just the, part. Yeah. <laughs> the origin story. Yeah. <laughs> um, so t tell me, did you bring, did you bring any stories for us, uh, from, I don't know, anything. I'm sure you got some, some interesting, uh, experiences and either, um, I yeah, I've 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 got uh, I've got a, a f some I don't know, like some are a bit more serious than others. But there's 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 one uh, character who I always describe that I I uh, think is absolute. Um, I mean that's what he is a complete character. He's hilarious. So this is my first surgical job. So I'm an intern, and I started wanting to be a surgeon. And initially, I was gonna go, I went down the cardiothoracic route to begin with, and. Ouch. So I was re really sort of, you know, in, into this, uh, into this job and yeah. they were colorectal surgeons and it was a big firm. That's the, the term for sort of all, all the, the consultants. And they were all kind of old school, um, minimum age of 50, all old white men. And it was that kind of old fashioned hierarchical 
um, structure and they worked us really, really hard. But every Friday they would buy us a massive fried breakfast and they would refuse to do any work until we'd all sat down. And when, once they saw how much I could put away, they were like, oh, this, this kid, he's, 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 he's tipped for surgical, uh, surgical glory. So I, I got on really well with him. But one of them, whose name I won't say, but he was quite senior in the British Army. Um, we just called him the Colonel. And he wore a pinstripe suit all the time um, and had sort of a shock of silver hair for each eyebrow, like just, you know, halfway up his forehead. It was just like caterpillars. And um, and clearly thought he was still on the battlefield. So, you know, he would recommend sort of battlefield medicine and... Um, uh, you know, then and then the other consultants would come along and say, "Rohan, don't don't do that. Just just give him some saline." You know, and um, uh, there are th there are three stories that uh, I like. Um, one was when we were sitting at our fried breakfast, and uh, one of the other consultants said, um, uh, "I hear you're going to Helmand Province. This was you know uh, uh, Afghanistan." And uh, he said, "Isn't that isn't that awfully dangerous?" And he said, "Humphrey, it's what I do." And uh, the the on the, the other two are concerning patients, so they're they're slightly more uh, crazy. But you know, in in general surgery, you often get people who come in with abdominal pain. They have a whole bunch of tests, and you can't find anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So one woman had had a CT scan, colonoscopy, upper GI endoscopy, all kinds of things, and 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 um, you know, not, and she was extremely anxious. She was just one of these people who's just positive that something terrible was going on and, and was, it was really jumpy. And we said, well, you know, we've done all these tests and, and um, she's OK. Um, and then he said, splendid, splendid, splendid. Well, you can go home. And she said, oh, I feel like I've wasted everybody's time. And he said, nonsense, nonsense, turned away and then came back, strangled her around the neck and went off with her head and then just walked off. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, and and so our job a lot of the time was just calming things down afterwards, like just dealing yeah. with <laughs> the you know, patients in yeah. And you had a sort of designated karma. Oh my god! But the, the worst one uh, was <laughs> when um, the wow. the sort of uh, resident and and I had done an appendicectomy um, uh, on a young girl who'd come in, sort of twenty years old. Uh, and she was fine. We didn't, you know, we didn't need any senior input in, in those days. It was a bit different. And so two days later, we're presenting to the to the boss and saying, this young woman had an appendicectomy, uncomplicated. She's ready to go home. And he's saying, oh, excellent. Jolly good. Now, you've got to bear in mind, this is a young woman with like a, about 20 men standing around her. And she's like just had an abdomen exam. So she's already feeling incredibly nervous and very uncomfortable. And then... You know, he turns away again, and we're like, oh, phew. and then he he, he uh, said, you know, my name is up there on the wall above your bed, but but I've never touched you once, and so she's still there with her top, you know, with her abdomen uh, revealed, and he just went <laughs> and poked his fingers <laughs> right oh into her belly button, <laughs> and just what? and just walked off. Um, but did he, he made that sound? Yeah, he made he he blew do, the raspberry. Yeah, he, he blew, blew the raspberry. raspberry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, An odd duck. Yeah. He's an odd uh, among yeah, other yeah. things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my god. It was a different uh, time. A different. Time. Yeah. What, what year are we talking here? Two thousand eight. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different time. It's not that long ago. <laughs> uh, but one of the takeaways that I I, I gather from from those stories uh, is that the the measure of how effective someone will be in a surgical field is how much you can eat. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. that was like I mean, a they, they, defining they would, they characteristic. Would, they would have long discussions with us about how they've had their gastric band loosened because they just weren't enjoying life to the full, full anymore. And, uh, all the vascular surgeons would have the fry up and then go outside and, and have a smoke. I mean, they're all cliches to a T. So, Oh my gosh. We're talking. These are fried breakfasts. You said fried. What does a fried breakfast and actually like consist of? Bacon, fried eggs, sausages, baked beans, hash browns. The uh, whole thing. And the whole thing. Yeah. 
Well, that'll keep you going during a 12 hour surgery, right. I suppose. You have to just be. If that's the one meal you have for right. a whole day. You need day your stamina. You're operating all day. I guess you need it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so uh, I, I can't imagine what turned you off from surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Well, those 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 were the I mean, yes. You're you're right. Basically, there are some very interesting characters in surgery. Mm-hmm. How did you decide on? Uh, so you decide you so cardiothoracic. You're kind of interested in it. You're like eh, maybe uh, you know the blowing raspberries in a patient's belly is not um, is not quite. Well, that, that- that was me. a colorectal surgeon. Oh, so. oh that, was, that was a colorectal. Okay. All right. Yeah. We don't want to, yeah. I don't want to talk to offend about any the cardiothoracic then. surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. They're not listening. They, they're too busy. That's the problem. That's, That's true. true. That's, That's problem. right. That's true. Hopefully they're not putting this on in the middle of the operating room. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so you, but you were interested in cardiothoracic surgery and then eventually decided, no, I'm just going to stick with the Yeah, I think it was mostly for, not for kind of lifestyle reasons. Um, yeah. And, you know, cardiology is still busy, but, but cardiothoracics really just felt like all consuming kind of yeah. career. And also, um, it, it kind of felt like the direction of travel was more cardiology was taking more work from cardiothoracics, you know, fewer bypasses, more stents oh, and yeah. things that, gotcha. that has to an extent maybe, um, plateaued, but, uh, no, but I'm, I'm definitely pleased I think you ended up made. in the right place for you because you and now you get to do all this. You get to explore all these other you know avenues and and with comedy and medicine. I mean, I was going to ask you actually. Do do you like has since the social media side of things taken off? Have you left your hours unchanged? Have you reduced how much clinical work you do? Or because I would love to. Yeah. But I, I <laughs> are I'm you still sure. are you working five days a week? Yeah, yeah, full time. But full time. Uh, I don't know if you you. Yeah. I've heard any of the kind of British news, but the, the the health service has fallen to pieces. So if I brought that up at work now, I think I'd I'd, I'd, <laughs> they, they I'd would someone cause, would strangle you. Some, yeah, and yeah, say exactly. off with your head. They would not take yeah. kindly to that. Well, <laughs> I you know it's it's um, I, I the only way I can do the things I'm doing outside of medicine. So even like this podcast, making all the videos, the only way I can do it is because I have the work schedule I have. So. I am a, a a part owner in the practice I'm in, in private practice, and I work four days a week. So I'm very fortunate that I I have that extra time that I could devote to outside interests. And um, if I was in if I was a cardiothoracic surgeon, there's a good chance I wouldn't have time to do all these types of things. And it's just this is what know. I'm saying. But then but again, yeah. doc, Dr. Oz, you know, is in many ways a cardiothoracic comedian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I wasn't sure where that was going to go, but I like That's that. That's true. That's <laughs> absolutely true. See, he was well, a le- he was a legit surgeon. He really was. He was I, yeah, it's, it's it's so it's so bizarre. And then um, a, you never know where what direction uh, life is going to take you. I guess Oprah yeah. comes calling, and all of a sudden, that's it. You're uh, a cardiothoracic comedian. Um, <laughs> let's take a quick break. All right, and then we're going to come back with a Rohan Francis, and we're going to. Uh, play a little game here in a second. So we'll be right back. A big thank you to all of our listeners. This is a new show. Spread the love, share with everyone, leave a rating and review. Tell us what you think. Be honest. We want to hear from you. Later today, we're going to share some of your favorite medical stories. Share yours. Knock, knock high at human-content.com. We also have a Patreon. Come hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. Hang out with us. Yep, we're over there. We're there. We're doing stuff. It's it's great. We love it over there. Uh, And uh, early episode access, bonus episodes, including a whole monthly show with Kristen and I, where I don't know who else it would be, but uh, uh, called The Monthly Eye Exam, uh, where we react to medical shows and movies and stuff. We have a new Monthly Eye Exam episode available now on Patreon. And this is, you tell us what we want to watch, what we're, what we're going to react to, what we're going to... Yeah, we want to hear from you guys yeah. of what you want to see us watch. He's he's a, a doctor. I'm not, though. I'm very squeamish. So yeah, the, please the, be the, easy the on me. The grosser the thing, the better, in my opinion. And I'm sure Kristen would agree. All right. Sign up for Patreon. Check it out. All right. We are back uh, with Dr. Francis here. And um, so... 
we are going to do something, um, play a little game called U.S. Healthcare Guess the Numbers. So oh. you're you know, one of our first guests from the U.K., and, uh, and so I thought this would be a good opportunity to just oh, talk about some of the differences between the, the, the medical system. You already mentioned that the uh, National Health Service is a bit in shambles. I'll, have to, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not real familiar with uh, what things are happening over there. Um, can you give me like a two-sentence summary? Uh, if you imagine a spectrum and the USA is at one end, of mm-hmm. just how to do things badly. Um, we are doing things equally badly, just in the complete opposite way. Oh, okay. So does that make any sense? Um, kind of? So you know, y- your system is very much, uh, you know, private privatized to the extent where money really rules everything and yeah. insurance companies oh, yeah. have so much power. Whereas ours is uh, publicly funded, but funded in the worst possible way so it, it's just completely mm. underfunded and gotcha. so it, it, it you know to make a serious point it, it is frustrating how uh the discussion about your health care service and ours tends to use the other one as an example of why things won't work if we do it differently but they ignore all the other countries where they have a much better health service than both of us you know right. so there's you, you can't you can't get a nice out little, there exactly yeah yeah, I uh, totally with you. And so, uh, how, how familiar? I guess you're 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 seem fairly familiar with the way we do things here in the U.S. Uh, and so, what I'm going to do is just bring up a few points, a few statements, and I might ask you to pick, you know, higher or lower, more or less, or have you guess a number. And then we'll just kind of go through it. Let's see how, how well you can do. Now, I have no expectations of you because okay, you don't well, that's live good. in this country. <laughs> and so uh, uh, it, it's um, if you guess some of these correctly, I'll, I'll be shocked and very impressed by you. <laughs> uh, all right. So we're going to start just uh, with some basics here. First of all, are you familiar with um, – you're familiar with like the, the kind of the basic structure of having health insurance in the U.S. is having a premium and a, de- and a deductible. Now, I find that a lot of people are kind of confused by the deductible aspect of things. Are you familiar with the deductibles? And Yeah, so that... I think that that's what we'd call an excess. So you've got your okay. flat fee that you pay, and then if you have that's the a premium. claim, yep. Yep. the premium, and then if you have a claim, you have to contribute a part of it. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of more or less uh, you know, what, what it is. There's different terms for it because you know the health insurance companies want to make it as confusing have, have as possible. have ways of, yes. of really trying to complicate they don't want, things. They don't, yeah, they don't want you understanding. They don't want you figuring it out. So the average premium, all right, per month for an individual. What do you think it is over here? Oh, actually, That's... I've never looked. I've never looked this up. Um, average. So average in, premium. Everyone who everyone who is insured, they're, they're mm-hmm. average. Yep. What do you think they're paying per month, per month. just to have a, a health insurance card that they can show um, to their doctor's office? $80? Obviously, eighty eighty dollars. Yeah. Um. It is six hundred and eighty dollars. <laughs> I per I, month. I think the sound cut out when I said six hundred. Six six hundred and eighty dollars. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so for the year, for an individual, about seven thousand nine hundred dollars for premium. Wow. For a family, for a family. One thousand eight hundred and seventy-one dollars per month. Now, this is based on I think twenty twenty-one data, uh, and so for a family, a family plan about twenty-two thousand dollars for the year. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Yeah. So that's that's Gosh. that's just getting your foot in the door for insurance. What's right? the average um, income in the in the U.S. Is it? Is it I think median income somewhere like forty-five fifty. No, no. Median right? median income is seventy thousand. Seventy thousand. So really, median. Yeah. Okay. Median income. And so uh, it's it's a significant having insurance is a significant percentage of the total mm. income. Yeah, and totally. Th- that's yeah. and that's part of the problem, uh, because obviously this disproportionately affects lower income people. Right, they're paying mm. much higher percentage uh, of their. Now there are some government programs. We have Medicaid. We have you know uh, things that for people who are uh, below a certain level of income that can they can have to 
to, to actually have insurance but not have to pay as much. But for a lot of people, they don't qualify for that. And so they're forced to go with private insurance. And so that's where you're getting those numbers for private insurance. All right. That was a good start. You almost, you all, you, again, the sound cut out, but you pretty much, you essentially got it. All right. Are, are you familiar with prior authorizations? I mean, only via you. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so, not good. And I ask you this first because I, I once gave a talk to a group of um, Canadian physicians and I mentioned prior authorizations off the cuff and I got a lot of confused looks. So this is, I think this is a more or less uniquely American thing. Uh, mm. And basically, for the for people who aren't aware, prior authorizations are when uh, the insurance companies uh, they say basically you send a claim. You're like, I want this for my patient, and they say no. You have to to we have to get some kind of documentation, some form, a phone call, peer to peer review, whatever, for us to be able to uh, to approve that. So basically, it's extra work. Uh, to prove that you as the doctor are are ordering something that's necessary. All right, so... Purportedly for the patient's protection. Right. And uh-huh. and, oh, and for, okay. for controlling health care costs. Right, there's all kinds of reasons that these, uh, these insurance companies... In the end, what it comes down to is being able to delay payment as long as possible because the longer you delay payment the longer you get to hold on to that money, right, as the insurance company. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so I think that's that's ultimately what the purpose is. Um, it probably didn't start out that way because there are ways that, or reasons, I would say, that maybe prior authorization could be necessary, but not to the extent that it is now. Uh, and so here comes, now here's here's my statement here. What do you think is the average number of prior authorizations performed by a physician in the U.S. per week? This is in 2022. So, so this is how often a physician will have to have to ask permission to do mm-hmm. something. Yes, before they do it. Um, let's say per week. I mean, let's say two two a day, so like ten. Okay. 40, 40 oh. prior authorizations per week. Wow. And what you'd find is that medical offices actually will hire people. If they can, they will hire people just to do this. And yeah, it's no a surprise. huge yeah. administrative burden. It's, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, uh, and it also, you know, it, it falls on pretty much every part of medicine as well. And so it's a, that's a big problem. So 40, 40, that's from a survey by the AMA. Uh, 2022. Okay. What is the average number of interns that cardiologists made cry in 2022? <laughs> what do you think? All of them. Uh, every single one that rotated uh, through. If they cor- are correct. worth their salt. <laughs> yes, correct. You got it. You got it right. The answer is all of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can't call yourself a cardiologist if you, if you don't make the interns cry. <laughs> Straight from the horse's mouth. That's right. All right. All right. I just I had to throw that one in there. Okay. What is the percentage of people in the U.S. that have medical debt right now? What do you think? Percentage of people in the U.S. with medical debt, if you had to guess. Okay, I think I've been lowballing everything, haven't I? So let's, let's be a bit... <laughs> um, okay. 30, 30%. Thank God you're way too high. Uh, it's 17%. Okay. So 17% okay. of people uh, right now have medical debt. And the average is twenty four hundred dollars. I'm honestly surprised that those numbers are not a little higher. I, I would have guessed they were higher. I too. tried my best to find accurate information. I'm not doubting you. I'm just and saying so, that's uh, if it's wrong, please. Uh, if you're listening surprised. to this and I'm way off, let me know. But these are the numbers that I read for 2021. I think that one was about 17 percent of people with medical debt. I mean, there's all kinds of debt, but medical debt. Sure. And, uh, and that's a lot, $2,400 per person. Okay. But it, it, um, is that the biggest cause of debt in the U.S.? Ooh, good question. I Student loan debt um, is a it. big one. Is it? But yeah, medical debt might be bigger because everyone it's eventually probably, needs yeah. medical I mean, care. I mean, 70%, that's like one in, I mean, one in five people have Almost, with medical yeah. debt. And that, that probably also, that number and would include, I am assuming, like children too. So if you're... Yeah. If you're, you know, separating out into, you know, um, into older generation, older, older people, then you probably get a much higher percentage. Mm-hmm. 
Um, okay. During calls with Blue Cross Blue Shield customer service. So Blue Cross Blue Shield is a one of our big insurance companies. During calls with Blue Cross Blue Shield customer service, what is the average amount of time that passes before somebody says an expletive? <laughs> um, one minute. <laughs> oh, close. Very good. So the answer is 56 minutes. But that includes hold time, which is 55 minutes. So you got it. It's right. One minute. <laughs> you, are, you are crushing this, my friend. Um, well done. Okay. I've got just a couple more here. In the last 10 years, how much money have private equity firms? So first of all, let me add. So are you familiar with the private equity thing that's happening here? So basically over the last 10, really 20 years, uh, there's been a a a lot of of money from private equity firms. So there are these. You know, I, I'm I'm not going to pretend like I know a lot about private equity firms, but they're like these financial firms that just have a lot of investors and they they raise all this money and they invest in different things. There's been a huge push over the last decade to buy up medical practices and uh, and hospitals and basically just getting into the medical um, uh, field, uh, which is not a good thing. I mean, we're talking, these are, these are the most for-profit types of ventures that are now kind of buying hospitals, which uh, is, um, uh, you know, wrought with all kinds of potential issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the last 10 years, how much money have private equity firms spent on healthcare acquisitions? Uh, what do you think? Are, are we, are we talking over a billion? Oh yes. Oh, oh okay. yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, I don't know. A hundred billion. A shade under one trillion. What? A shade under one trillion dollars has been spent on healthcare acquisitions uh, since 2010. And so that comes out to 11% of nursing homes nationwide are owned by private equity. Mm. Astonishing. Uh, 4% of hospitals at this point. That's from the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. So 11% of nursing homes, 4% of hospitals nationwide owned by private equity. So you got these financial guys that are that are running things. It's, uh, they just, yeah, they're going to prioritize scary. Scary. profit, I guess, yeah. And then my last, my last question for you, okay. What was my blood pressure close. at my most recent checkup <laughs> with my doctor? Can you tell just by looking at him? <laughs> Off the what top was, of the... the <laughs> what was my blood pressure at my the, most... The, the mercury, mercury, he's the an mercury ophthalmologist. Just... <laughs> what do you think? You, ha you have oh, you... to guess. You okay. have to guess. 165 systolic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Man, he really doesn't think much of my ability to... Con to, to... You did say you almost exercised at the beginning. Okay, about okay. His... First, the, and the only reason I'm asking you this is I because it was... it was a stress mediated It was 119 response, over 71, okay? <laughs> well, it was... you just calm It's meant a... to be a humble cat. Cat. Really? Yes, exactly. Uh, I, You're practicing your mindfulness. I am the epitome of health. And yes, I say that knowing that I had a cardiac arrest. <laughs> Three years ago. Okay. But otherwise, yes, I am the epidemi epidemi of health. You can't even get it oh, out of your mouth. Oh, it's a, oh, it's a here we go. I have a note from one of our producers. Home mortgage debt is the oh, largest sure. debt in the US. Makes sense. There you oh. go. That makes that makes sense. I didn't even think about that. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, that's uh, I'd put that in a slightly different category though, I think. It is a little bit uh, I feel like a little it's bit different. It's an investment as well. It's still so debt. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. you know. But anyway. Yeah. anyway. Um yeah, one night. Are you? Uh, that's good. Good blood yeah, pressure, I'm proud right? Yeah, you. Are you proud of me? I, I am. I, yeah. I just want. I just want everyone to know. It's. I am. <laughs> I'm very healthy. I'm doing. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. What was yeah, your yeah. last blood pressure? Do you, I'm sure you check your own. You probably check your oh, own. Do you have one? Jugular at home? vein. Check and, it every morning. And I, yeah, I, every morning with my my JVP time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just. <laughs> you got a good that A was wave. The, that was. That was the. That was the. Pièce de résistance in that skit. That was just so good. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, well, um, do you have any projects going on? Like, where do, where can people find you? What are, tell us what you're doing. What am I doing? I, I, these days, I've mostly just being. Uh, I've it's moved working. out of London um, uh, in the last year or so, so I'm I'm settling into more quieter life, 
growing vegetables, barbecuing, and all the kind of middle-aged dad stuff, doing lots of DIY. But, That's awesome. Uh, I don't want people to find me doing those things. So if, if people, <laughs> so if, if, if people want to find me, then uh, yeah, YouTube's my main kind of hangout. I'm spending less time on um, Twitter these days. Uh, I think that's that's uh, a lot of people are feeling that. Not necessarily in reaction to anything specific. I just feel like I get more satisfaction from making stuff on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. And I've got a few exciting projects I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this year. Um, so uh, I'm trying to push that production value even higher. Good. To, um, to try and try and uh, leave. Maybe the you can tips. give him some tips. I could learn a bit. Well, from you. He, he doesn't need any tips. He, are, are you at a million yet on YouTube? Not, I'm only not, at half not, a million. Not yet. Uh, it's about 800, 850, 800 something. Thousand, yeah, something eight, like yeah. that. Oh, 850,000. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I think it's, it's easier whenever you're doing shorts. Like the, what I found is that the YouTube shorts, because, you know, they, they just unrolled the yeah. YouTube shorts. Which you are going to be monetized from April. They are. They're going to be monetized. Um, they're, it's easier to, to build up a subscriber base if you're sure. doing a lot of shorter videos. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't want uh, you to feel kind, bad about your 500,000. That's kind 000. of you to say. That's, that's quite, say. That's, that's a huge accomplishment. Uh, but really, honestly, everyone should check out Rohan. Uh, uh, what, what's the handle? It's Medlife uh, Crisis. Medlife Crisis. Medlife Crisis on YouTube. Fantastic See, there's a good videos. medical pun. I love it. I, that's... No, you hate puns. Well, no, I, that's fine. Yeah, I, that's I don't a like, really like good one. saying puns. I'm not like a uh, like think of puns off the top of my head kind of guy. I love but a good pun. I please. Oh, my yeah, name I is mean... Doctor Glockenflecken. I you, I can't be criticizing anybody's name at this point. Uh, but you know, check out Medlife Crisis on YouTube. Uh, great videos. Keep up the awesome work, man. It's, it's really, um, I'm impressed with with what you're doing and all the educational aspects and the comedy. I love the wry, the, the, the kind of the very dry sense of humor. It's great. Uh, so keep up the great work, man. Well, thanks so much. It's been a real privilege uh, to talk to you both. And uh, yeah, it's great to to sort of, uh, yeah. after after chatting a little online, to, to, to talk face to face. Yes, that's right. Closer, closer yeah, as right. we can get. That's right. Well, thanks again. And uh, we will be back in a few minutes with your, um, a few minutes. What am I talking about? It's like right after this. It's yeah. like oh, a few so minutes. quick. One minute, two minutes. I don't know. We'll be back with your listener stories. All right. Thanks, Dr. Francis. Bye. All right. Let's take a look at some of our favorite medical stories sent in by you, the listeners. Got a couple of Pretty funny ones today. Okay. All right. Let's hear it. I didn't say we got a couple of good ones because I always say we got a couple of good ones. Yeah. Well, they I are need, always good. I need good. to start saying something different. I got to like, well, like mix things up a little It's hard to be bit. smart. <sighs> okay. All right. <laughs> uh, so our first one, anonymous. This is, uh, they're both anonymous today. Uh, so I was a fairly stupid teenager, or weren't we all? Yeah. And I was very heavily influenced by video games. <laughs> okay. <laughs> When I was 14, I poorly welded some scrap metal together and made a not so nice sword. I was throwing Oh boy. <laughs> you know where this is going. I was throwing it into the air like what? the What? Why? Like the victory of my favorite game at the time. Okay. And something made a sound distracting me a little. I caught it, but a little further up than the handle. I could see bone and some connective tissues. Uh. <laughs> so it absolutely required stitches <laughs> we got to the er and we told the nurse that i got sliced on some sheet metal in the shop <laughs> <laughs> well not entirely it's a little, wrong a little white lie it's okay <laughs> the doctor said all right level with me what really happened <laughs> i love it doctors know and i told him the full story he said it's not as bad as a patient i had years ago didn't have a good mall so he threw the logs against a tree, and wouldn't you know it, Murphy's Law took effect and sent one of the logs right back at him. Mm. 13 stitches to the forehead. Oh my gosh. Made me feel a little bit better, but I knew I was still dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I have a story that's there's very always, similar to that. There's always someone that did something dumber. That's, that's, yeah. I always remember that. If you think you did something dumb, there's always something that happened that was a little bit dumber. That's right. Yeah. I was, I, when I was a gymnast back in the day, I um, accidentally kicked myself in the face once and gave myself a black eye with my foot. 
<laughs> that doesn't surprise me. That was embarrassing to explain. You're an extremely clumsy person. It's true. So it's, uh, I'm just, you know, I, I don't, I'm glad you haven't done it since. Yeah. Just the one time. Okay. Uh, well, once, once is enough. All right. Our second story. So uh, far. <laughs> comes from uh, an anonymous listener. Hi there. My story happened a few years back. Somehow I got infected with bacteria called Staphylococcus mm. aureus. So when you hear like MRSA. Doesn't sound good. Like MRSA is mm-hmm. Staph aureus. Mm-hmm. I had very painful pimples in certain areas like on my thighs and unfortunately around my intimate area. So I went to the doctor and they helped with the situation around my thighs. I didn't know how to ask them to help with the pimples elsewhere. Eventually I mumbled something about it and they checked and there was nothing. No pimples, (laughs) nothing. Totally normal. Both male nurses were looking at each other in silence. Basically, I came across as a, quotes, pervert female trying to get some weird action. <laughs> I promise you that is that was not a big deal to your medical team. All right. There's, that's just something. I mean. I feel like that's when you call, like, you know, the professional for help. And then by the time they get there, it's like the problem just magically oh, resolved. Oh, all the time. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I, I, fortunately, I, I don't, like, look in that area of the body. I don't think anybody wants an yeah, ophthalmologist down weird. there. Mm-hmm. But it does happen with eyeballs. Like, people will say, oh, I've been having these symptoms. You finally you get the appointment. You come in, and it's mm-hmm. gone. Yeah, uh, and then you go home, and boom, it's back. So, trust me, no matter what kind of thing you think you have anywhere on your body, like, we don't care. We'll we'll help you. We'll check it out. We'll see it. I mean, I say we as like medical professionals yeah. as a whole, uh, not your eye doctor. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, don't worry about that, Anonymous. Send us your stories at knockknockhi at human-content.com. We'd love to hear them. We love, I love reading through these stories every You're week. So it's good. great. That's it for our show. We had a, um, an awesome guest, Dr. Rohan Francis, Medlife Crisis on YouTube. Been wanting to talk with him for a while because I, I, I just I love people who are trying to bring comedy into the medical field. And I, such a good job of, of really the writing of his videos. Mm-hmm. I'm really impressed with it's, it. It all flows. It's, it's very funny. Great dry sense of humor. You guys uh, are kindred spirits. Yeah, except yeah. he's better at communicating. Uh, is he is a, and that's why uh, I think he's better at the educational aspect than me for sure. Um, and and so I I always I try to encourage like I we went we need more people more because there's a lot a lot of you are very funny. I, I've re, I've read I've read your comments on social media like you guys routinely make me laugh, uh, especially like on the, the YouTube comments. And so um, uh, we need more people in medicine telling jokes and, and showing that side of themselves. So I, I love it. I yeah. think it's great. And we got to talk about uh, our wonderful health uh, mm-hmm. systems, mm-hmm. U.S. healthcare and, and the U.K. as well. And uh, that's always a trip. Now, <laughs> I, I can tell, I know that I, I pulled a lot of those stats today mm. uh, from what I what I. I tried to find the most reputable sources, but if I got anything wrong, please like let me know, uh, and I will uh, issue a correction. The point is, everything's it's very bad. expensive here. <laughs> that's that's really the point. Expensive and so time consuming, and and it's uh, it's just it's just bad. The one thing I didn't get to, mm. which I I, I just want to say real quick because I was very proud of this. I didn't get to this one. Um, I was going to ask him which of these is higher. So I'm going to ask you. Okay. Which of these is higher? The United Healthcare fourth quarter revenue. Fourth quarter. Fourth just quarter. Fourth just quarter. fourth quarter. 2022. Or the revenue for Google in all of 2022. Ooh. Well, I'm a very good test taker. And so I know that because you phrased it that way, that the fourth quarter revenue is going to be higher. I tricked you. No, that's not. <gasps> Yeah, so y'all, you know, talk. You better, you better find <laughs> out if you got the right answer for you. Talking up your test taking skills. It's close though. Uh, United Healthcare fourth quarter revenue in 2022 was 62 billion dollars. Mm-hmm. That's billion with a B. Fourth quarter. United Healthcare, 62 billion dollars. Okay. Google all of 22, 69 billion. Okay. See, the point still stands. <laughs> okay, the reasoning was solid. United Healthcare's uh, revenue for all of 2022. 
$324 billion. That is just stupid. It's a lot of money. Who it's needs money. that much money? Uh, I guess they do. I don't know. Um, anyway, I just want to get that last little uh, tidbit. You know, anytime, I, any chance I get to kind of throw a little barb in there to United Healthcare, mm-hmm. I love to do it. Um, there's lots of ways to reach out to us. We want to hear your stories. Tell us what you think. Uh, you can email us, knockknockhigh at human-content.com. We're on social media, uh, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter. Uh, you can also hang out with us in our human podcast, human content, our human podcast, <laughs> our human content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. Thank you to all the great listeners leaving wonderful feedback. Thank you for the reviews. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. All right. So we have Alice W on Patreon said superb first episode. It was most enjoyable to hear from Dr. Shaw, and the hiking trip was hilarious. Mm. Yeah, was, have you recovered from that, by the way? adventure diagnosis. Did all of your rashes go away? All my rashes are now gone. Okay, That's good. That's fortunate, all the, at least the ones that you would normally be able to see. Uh, YouTube, we are releasing episodes every week on my YouTube channel at D. Glockenflecken. Uh, also, we're on Patreon. Lots of cool perks on our Patreon. Bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies. We have a community there. We're building a community. Yeah, active. It's a, we, we have building, a we so have a community. Uh, come join come us. Join and help We're us build it. it. Uh, you get early ad-free episode access, interactive Q and A, live stream events, a lot more coming. Uh, patreoncom slash Glockenflecken or go to Glockenflecken.com. Speaking of Patreon community perks, we have uh, new members. Let's shout out the new Woo! members: Lori, April S, Eleanor F, Sax Daddy. Ooh. Sex Daddy is here. <laughs> Alyssa L. Thank you all. Uh, also, shout out to, of course, the Jonathans out there. Uh, big, uh, silent uh, head nod to all of you. Patrick, Lucia C. Joy N. Sharon S. Omar. Edward K. Abby H. Stephen G. Roskbox. Jonathan F. Marianne W. Mr. Granddaddy. Caitlin C. Brianna L. Thank you all. And Patreon Roulette. That's my roulette sound. Oh, okay. Is, it, Is that, that it? That was Is terrible. That I, I, I just did that off the cuff. I didn't plan that. Shout out to Leah S. Leah S. For being a Patreon. Thanks to all of you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. We're your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, a.k.a. The Glock and Fleckens. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Rohan Francis. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brook. Our editor and engineer is uh, Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omer Benzvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program disclaimer and ethics policy, submission verification, licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockandfleckens.com or reach out to us, knockknockhigh at human-content.com. With any questions, concerns, or if you have to, fun medical puns. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Knock Knock, goodbye. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.